Hello, and welcome to today's webinar topic on the future of identity management, the next five years. My name is Kim Locke. I'm with Radiant Logic, and I'll be your moderator for today's program. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that your lines will be muted for the duration of the webinar. However, if you have a question, you may enter it in the question portal, and we will have a Q&A session at the end, if time allows. If we are not able to get to your question during the webcast, we'll send a personal email to follow up. Also, this webcast will be recorded and sent out along with a copy of the presentation slides. Oh, sorry, uh, presentation slides. Um, within the next 24 hours. Our speakers today are Gary Rowe, CEO and Principal Consulting Analyst for Tech Vision Research. He's a seasoned technology analyst, consultant, advisor, executive, and entrepreneur. Mr. Rowe helped architect, build, and sell three companies, has been an identity management thought leader for 30 plus years, and was president of Burton Group from 1999 to 2010. He is also the co-author of the Future of Identity Management Research Report. And stepping in for Wade Ellery today is Lisa Grady, Senior Solutions Architect at Radiant Logic. Lisa has been with us for 20 years in a variety of technical roles and is currently a member of our product management team. She is an expert in identity integration and directory, directory virtualization and has been helping Radiant Logic customers solve some of their toughest identity and group integration challenges for many years. We'll start with you, Gary. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. And thanks to uh, Radiant Logic and to everyone attending. We are certainly in unique times and uh, we put a lot of thought into this presentation. This is actually the fourth year that at the beginning of the year, we've had the opportunity to provide our perspective on where identity management is, where it's going and so forth. Um, So uh, we already presented my background. The bottom line is I've been involved in identity and access management through many iterations over many, many years. Uh, our company, Tech Vision Research, basically covers a lot of what I'll characterize as core infrastructure technologies, identity and security and data in this new digital enterprise. I kind of view it as the integration since we work with large enterprises, the integration of Wall Street, big companies, and Silicon Valley, how do we move forward? What's the vision? And, um, you know, so, so we look at these capabilities, but primarily focus on connecting the dots. How does this affect and impact enterprises? And we do it with everyone on our team, both focused on research and consulting. So... Uh, there's tremendous synergies on both sides with a, with a very senior level team. On the research side, we have all the analyst briefings and the reviews and get kind of the latest thinking from the vendor side and develop this primary research. But then on the consulting side, we have the on the ground knowledge. Uh, we work through these issues with many, many large corporations and I'll give you some of those insights in the uh, in today's presentation and I do want to say that even though I'm the person delivering this these perspectives represent a lot of the thinking uh, from tech vision resource group research across our analyst team so what might you get out in a perfect world from today's webinar to take a fresh look to recalibrate your identity and access management program and in light of this new normal, in light of the emerging digital enterprise, which has emerged on steroids over the last 10 months, technology trends, disruptors, uh, and gain an informed outside perspective on the future of IAM and input towards your IAM strategy, your priorities. Uh, we strongly recommend looking at entertaining uh, developing a reference architecture, and I'll talk a little bit about that. To apply our top 12 list, which which I'll touch on in a minute, to reason check your priorities. And, you know, we don't believe just because, um, you know, we have this data 
uh, you know, in these insights and these recommendations that, that necessarily needs to be your priority priorities, but um, certainly use it to evaluate your, your priorities and directions and so forth. And then to get a little bit tactical in this, in this short webinar, um, you know, how, how do you actually execute on this? Uh, how do you migrate? How do you integrate? What are some of the next steps to actually deliver this this next generation foundation? So I'll spend a little bit of time at the beginning talking about identity and access management in, in light of this new normal. You know, everyone working at home, shopping at home, staying at home. Uh, I'm in the beautiful state of California and we have very stringent stay-at-home orders. Um, I'm doing this from my living room. It's probably many of many of you are connected from there. You know, we've seen 10 years, and there's been all kinds of memes around this, but you know, looking at where we are today, 10 years of digital transformation in 10 months. Um, but we can think about this in the context of lessons learned in applying this to, to, to the future state. And then there's also been acceleration around not just identity, but all kinds of new disruptive technologies, new innovative business models. Some of these business models are just frankly for survival uh, and some trends to consider. So I'll net that out. We'll look at a top 12 list that we believe are areas of focus driving and thinking about and planning for the future of your, your identity uh, infrastructure. And then I'll talk a little bit briefly. Uh, we actually did, Doug Simmons and I did, uh, you know, a half day webinar that really dove into reference architectures and planning and so forth. But I'll at least give you a quick framework there. And then we'll close with an action plan. Then I'll turn it over to Radiant Logic to get their perspectives. So big picture, overarching trends. You know, it, where do we see technology and business? And I've netted this into you know six buckets. There are lots and lots of buckets, and then we'll talk about maybe how that relates to identity and access management, where we see that going. You know, I start with what we characterize, and we've seen so many uh, programs that kind of are leading us in this direction, but it's what we characterize as the automation of everything. You know, it's robotics, it's leveraging artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks, robotics process automation, and the, the progress that's been made in the last, uh, you know, five to seven years has been phenomenal. You know, when we thought about robots circa 2014, very limited in terms of functionality, now leveraging AI and machine learning in neural, uh, neural networks and nanotechnology, uh, there's some amazing things that can be done there. Um, and then simple things, robotics process automation, taking standard processes, looking to automate them uh, and, and remo removing, you know, human intervention for repetitive common tasks. Uh, but a lot of that leverage is then the data and the insights about everything. So the sensors, the IoT devices, the collection of all this information, you know, serving up instances you know, very quickly with cloud-based services. And then future computing technology, quantum computing is, is fascinating. Our ability to, to pull all of this information together and process it so quickly. But while we have more powerful capabilities, there's also trends to distribute things and decentralize things and not necessarily have everything under, you know, the control of a few vendors. So we look at... Uh, blockchain and smart contracts and distributed ledger technology, uh, things moving to the edge, uh, distributed computing, peer-to-peer uh, -peer interactions where we don't necessarily need to have a heavy-handed middle person, you know, in, in the middle of every transaction. The merging of physical and logical, um, you know, nanotechnology, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, 
but we have to connect. So tremendous progress and pervasive connectivity at higher speeds to the masses. The real opportunity though, is to take what I have up here, and obviously this is a subset, uh, and converge them and leverage them for business benefit, new business models, driving sales, time to market, personalization, flexibility, and so forth. So, so that's kind of the backdrop before we dive into, if I can progress my slide, there we go. So I, I am in this new normal. One of the things we think a lot about, uh, because obviously the world has changed, the pandemic will dissipate. Uh, we won't be the same. We also want to be careful that we don't overcorrect. And and you know, frankly, a lot of the a lot of the top twelve lists and a lot of the problems and challenges we've had for within identity and access management have been there for twenty or thirty years. And we've made some progress, but you know, those challenges are still there. Uh, that doesn't really change just because we're scaling things with, with folks working at home and so forth. But we do know, and we've said this for years, the digital footprint is going to continue to grow. Expectations for the user experience are so much higher than they were. Uh, the automation, the innovation, the, the, the disruptions, we have to accommodate that within our identity management ecosystems and foundation. So there, were, there are lessons to be learned from 2020. Uh, and we've worked with a lot of organizations that I'm not sure if anyone did well, but did okay uh, because they had made some of the right investments in their IAM foundation, scalability, adaptability, um, and others who you know, were really scrambling, had major challenges. So 2021 is going to be a year to learn. It's going to be a year to fine tune, solidify your foundation. Uh, think about it in the bigger picture, in the context, hopefully between vaccinations and so forth, we can move towards something other than what 2020 looked like, hopefully. But, um, you know, we are moving much more heavily towards a, a truly digital enterprise where it's a core part of our business. It's not this, it's not this side thing. And IAM, in my opinion, I said this last year and the year before, it will be as core as anything to determining su success or failure in your digital enterprise. Another thing we've talked about, and I just want to reemphasize, is that uh, you know, identity really, truly is now. We were moving in that direction, but it really is this the only viable perimeter. And, you know, it's not the physical limitations. It's not the firewalls. But not only is it our only viable perimeter, it's, it's a perimeter that needs to include all of these new things that are, that, that are occurring. You know, IoT at scale, consumerization, democratization, personalization, the internet of me, new privacy and regulatory controls, markets and industries, you know, like banking and retail that are fundamentally changing, uh, you know, the movement to the cloud, some of the new technologies that I've talked about. So I am has to choreograph those things, has to coordinate it. So major, major challenges there. So our top 12 list. Um, I'll get into the list next, but I'm doing a couple of different things this year. The past couple of years, I've just put a list together and said all these things are important. That's why they're on the list. So this, this time we're looking to kind of prioritize them a bit, put them in containers. And um, governance, security, and user experience are three areas we believe from an IAM perspective should be highly prioritized. Um, we're starting with some of those foundational technologies and then looking at other areas that support them within that list. Uh, we're, we're absolutely factoring in, hopefully not overly factoring in, uh, the new normal 
and the acceleration of the uh, digital enterprise. So here's the list. Uh, at the top of the list, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, is governance, centralized identity governance. You know, there are so many cats out there, and, you know, our ability to herd them uh, is in increasingly challenging and increasingly important. You know, we talked about things moving to the edge and, you know, advanced computing capabilities and user independence and not having this well-defined perimeter anymore. Uh, from, from a corporate perspective, from the security posture perspective, centralized identity governance is going to be absolutely key. And if I was to pick one area where almost every client of ours needs to really be thinking about it's centralized, coordinated, choreographed uh, identity governance. Uh, Doug Simmons from our team did a report last year that it, uh, because it's not just identity governance, he looked at identity and security governance and data governance and really how, how those things fit together. But a lot of it starts with the identification of everything and figuring out how you model that. It's part, and I'll talk about governance in a minute, but it's part technology and it's part collecting that data and understanding, but it's also part process. It's having the policies and being able to execute on them and to be able to change quickly. That's another lesson from 2020 is, you know, be resilient, be able to change. Uh, one of the topics we've, we've looked at for the last couple of years, and identity has a tremendous impact on this, is the concept of zero trust. Uh, but given some of the challenges that are out there, we're actually collapsing that with zero friction because they need to go together. You just can't lock down everything at all times and have a poor user experience. And for, for most of us, for most of our businesses, that's just, just not going to work. So it's this combination of locking down ecosystems, understanding our ecosystems, supporting the concepts of zero trust, but really thinking about the user experience, which brings me to the third point, which is all about the user experience. Virtually every consulting project we've done in 2020, a senior executive, a line of business leader, a CIO, a CISO, basically said, this is our number one priority. We have to, you know, we're digitally engaging now in new ways. And the way we engage, the perception that we have is absolutely critical. And I'll talk when we get to some of these other points about some of the means to be able to provide this better user experience and this frictionless security and so forth. Uh, customer IAM, this is probably a pretty obvious one but we're extending our footprint in new ways. And there's been tremendous development uh, by the vendors in the customer IAM area. That's not to say this will be a separate area forever, because we're also seeing convergence. We're seeing vendors that uh, you know, have, have modules or filters that support customer IAM, enterprise IAM, the integration of IoT devices and so forth. The, uh, number five, the recognition that cloud, um, while virtually every company has a program to move more and more to the cloud, that on-prem is going to be here for the foreseeable future. And, and we should just own up to that. And we should recognize that a lot of the management challenges and governments, governance challenges and integration challenges are in this hybrid environment. So, you know, we have that on the list. New authentication models, when we talk about usability, and when we talk about the risk of exposing data that shouldn't be exposed, a lot of that ties into the authentication models and the information that uh, is collected by virtually every, every site an individual goes to. So we're looking at password lists authentication, every single major vendor has some program to move us in that direction. Um, controls in particular, in the major attack point, privileged access management, 
uh, the, the de facto support for multi-factor authentication, which is getting simpler and easier to integrate. And then consistent with the speed I was talking about earlier uh, and some of the governance challenges, the emergence of just-in-time capabilities, including JITPAM, uh, where the major vendors are, are, are making substantive investments in that. Number seven on the list is the scale and speed. I don't think I need to talk about that. You know, our IAM services are just going to have to handle that. So we've got to be thinking about that uh, for our foundation. The IAM of everything, all kinds of new object classes. You know, a lot of the future stuff that I was talking about before, from contextual data to IoT devices, to the relationships of those IoT devices, to tokens, consent tokens uh, that, that are required for, for, for GDPR and so forth. Uh, to decentralized identifiers. I'll talk about that a little bit uh, under number 12. Uh, but we have to be inclusive. Uh, it's capital IAM, not just what we were thinking about years ago with a heavy emphasis on, on the enterprise employees. Uh, AI and machine learning, and, and, and you've heard me talk about this several times now, but it's really critical. Every IAM vendor is investing in it. There are, there are third-party programs that are investing in it. Uh, if we think about frictionless security, a lot of it's based on understanding normal and abnormal activity. And if we have greater data that can uh, understand patterns better, understand good and bad actors, we can uh, both be frictionless and really dig in uh, smartly when there are bad uh, potential anomalous activities occurring. Identity and security, you know, we talk about DevOps and microservices and the downsizing of things. Well, the identity controls and the security controls need to be part of that. A uh, big emphasis still on regulatory controls and privacy protecting. We're getting much more invasive now. We're into the homes. And, um, you know, uh, uh, identity services with the right capabilities, the right structure uh, can be an important element in that. And last but not least, decentralized identity. I have it 12 on the list because it, it, it is a ways out. Uh, but it's very disruptive, and I'll talk about that in a minute as well. So, preparing for the digital enterprise, we want to start with governance, as I've, as I've said several times. It, in almost every consulting engagement, it is one of the biggest problems. It's one of the most costly areas, and it's getting harder. All of the stuff that I was talking about, the new object types, the scale, uh, the new types of consumers, the lack of the perimeter and so forth, that's making it harder, so we have to focus on it. Uh, it also involves people, which are really hard. Uh, so we want to think about new models, new ways of collecting information, leveraging some of the technologies that I've talked about before, and automating as much as we can, ensuring that that it, you know, maybe 80% uh, can be automatable. And, and governance models themselves will, will change. So, you know, they've been very static over the years. You know, you have resources, collection mechanisms, and formalized processes. Needs to be more dynamic, again, leveraging some of these technologies. And they're separate things. There's, of course, AI vendors, but also every, every, major identity vendor is, is looking into this and looking at adaptive contextual access capabilities. So the identity problem in the user experience, this is one thing that, you know, we were making this case over the last three, four or five years as we're looking at alternative identity models and trying to get through some of the password, you know, ID challenges. Uh, but these numbers were pulled pre-COVID. I, I don't know what the number is, but I can safely guess it's higher than what it was before in terms of our digital engagement. And, you know, it's, it's collapsing under its own weight. So there's some real challenges there. 
but but what we want to do is we want to move to a passwordless, more simple, easy to use environment. But at the same time, we also want to better secure it. So we're instantiating MFA. I think in, in most of our clients are moving in this direction as kind of the the, the, the de facto standard. Um, um, and of course, you know, the challenge, as I've said a few times, it's getting bigger and bigger with bring your own device, bring your own identities. Uh, and the good news is, you know, when we think about password lists, a lot of the major vendors are basically stating, I mean, it's, it's not fully executed yet, but they're stating the password is dead and have programs in place to look to address that. So decentralized identity, and I'm, I'm not spending a lot of time on this, but keep it on your radar. Um, it is, I believe, the disruptive model in the identity space. And it basically flips the script from one where, you know, even if we consolidate, we do, you know, password vaulting and all kinds of things, to simplify the user experience, it's, it's still a big challenge. At one point, the flipping the script is I as an individual basically control my identity. I control who I will communicate with. I present credentials. And then we're seeing an emerging ecosystem where uh, what's called verifiable claims or verifiable credentials can then be verified and validated. And it may be I'm looking for a job and you know I claim I have some advanced degree. Uh, well, the university could be part of that ecosystem. Uh, and only uh, from a security and a privacy perspective, only answer the authorized question, do I have that degree or not, and limit uh, you know, additional personal data. Still a ways out. But I'm encouraged because of the fact that Microsoft has a major program, IBM does, uh, Ping just bought a company in this area, SAP, uh, lots and lots, companies like Evernum, lots of early stage companies uh, making progress in this area. So how do, I, how do I pull this together? How do I architect a solution to fit within this new model? And some of these points I've made Identity governance, it's not an afterthought. It's one of the things you focus on. We got to scale, but but you want to formalize your IAM programs. This isn't just going to happen. The stakes are really too high. And you want to start with this foundation. You want to go back to basics. You want to, and, and so when we think of building out a reference architecture, you start with your current state capabilities, you collect requirements, it's business as well as technology, uh, develop a, a capabilities-based reference architecture. Uh, take a look at, as you're pulling your requirements together, business outcomes, and I won't go through these in detail because they're, they're just examples, but they're, they're real examples that we pulled from a lot of you know, consulting engagements. Um, you know, provisioning, deprovisioning, attestation means by which you you improve your customer experience, your employee experience, typical unmet needs, and these these are real things from from several engagements. You know, self service capabilities, self service password capabilities. Um, you know, tricky areas that a lot of times you know isn't isn't on the, the vendor brochures, you know, even when you have uh, roles in place, the, the, the ways those roles propagate to groups and so forth are not always factored in. So we believe that 2020 is really the time to formalize this reference architecture. Capabilities based, and, and, and a key point is that second bullet I have up there. It puts your enterprise in control of your own destiny. Um, I, we've dealt with so many organizations you know, over the last 20, 30 years where they just kind of like sheep follow a path where the vendors are saying, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, here's our next release and their next release, and, and you get 
improve capability, but this is another part of flipping the script where you go through your process, you define your reference architecture, you prioritize the use cases that you want to focus on, you develop your roadmap and look for those capabilities. So again, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it starts with kind of the highest level perspective. And when you think about identity, it's all about interact, access, change, manage, store, and measure, having control mechanisms in place. And then you can continue to build on this. So the second level then looks at, well, how do you interact? Well, more and more, it's any device, anytime, anywhere, various forms of IAM clients from the consumer, from the developer, from the integrator, various access models and change models and feedback mechanisms. And then at the next level, and by the way, uh, these slides will be made available and, and you know, we, can, we can separately talk, talk more about these, but this is, this is what we do very regularly. So now the, the interaction can be fully broken out by you know, robotic process, processes, they need to be managed within these ecosystems. Uh, Chatbots, uh, self-service UIs, uh, various forms of access and control and all kinds of analytics. But, but it's not just about the reference architecture, it's then orchestrating these. And it's then taking these models and these are some of the things that Radiant Logic will, will, will talk about when I hand the token over in a minute. Uh, but it's about orchestrating these, these investments and connecting the old with the new and doing that in very inclusive ways. And, you know, when you think about this new normal, and, and we continue to try to come up with different ways of kind of looking at you know, processes and flows and how identity should work, but you can pretty simply break things up. Uh, you know, there's, there's all of these new sources of input, uh, you know, bringing your own identity, provisioning at some point, you know, your own tokens that you bring, uh, they fit into both, both hybrid public clouds uh, and on-premise services, they're stored, you have rules for access, you have rules for governance, uh, and then a feedback loop with, with analytics and the increasing footprint and importance of IoT. So I have two slides to close. Uh, you know, in 2021, it's all about building your identity foundation for this new normal, but that includes fixing a lot of the challenges you may already have. We all know it's really hard to do. Um, the digital enterprise is transitioning from point programs to, you know, frankly, in some industries, the business. So we need to be cognizant of that, think about that in our identity programs. Um, IAM is critical in support of this safe digital enterprise. So, I'll leave you with, um, you know, recommendations, consider, look at, think about, we put a lot of work into, you know, this, this top 12 list, you may have other things, but factor that in to your reference architecture, to your future state model, invest in governance, look to automate, look to simplify and protect, make sure you're balancing the user experience with the zero trust and the inclusiveness. Uh, think about a model that's open, adaptive, scalable. When we go back to lessons learned in 2020, uh, those that, that could say this legitimately uh, had a far easier time. And, but understand the legacy systems, the hybrid environments, the conflicting governance models, a lot of this, uh, is going to be here for a lot, long time, needs to be orchestrated. And uh, Radiant Logic will, will now uh, talk about their approach and how they execute on it. I want to leave you with, uh, we didn't do a conference in, in 2020 for obvious reasons. We are putting a stake in the ground. 
for 2021. It's going to focus on a lot of identity and security and new models and topics like that. So go to our website. Uh, you can at least put yourself on a list. Uh, we won't charge anyone until we're sure we can actually do the conference, but we are putting that stake in the ground. So anyways, thank you, and I will turn it over to Lisa. Great. Thank you, Gary. Get my screen up here. Okay. All right. So Gary talked about uh, the new normal and some of those aspects involving work from home, shop from home, so the need for creating more digital transformations, and this directly relates to the challenges of also evolving your IAM architectures. The user populations are expanding from users to contractors, uh, vendors, partners, customers. On the application side, you're no longer looking at just those applications on premises inside your corporate domain, but partner applications and cloud applications. On the device side, you also have to deal with not only the enterprise computers, but more and more personal devices. So all these different vectors are growing, and Gary touched upon this also in one of his um, reference architecture slides. Federation um, on the application side has been a solution for this type of expansion, and that often involves synchronizing your global identity list into your chosen identity provider. So during the second half of today's webinar, I'm going to talk about um, the reason why simply federating the access to your applications isn't enough when you have complex identity integration challenges to start with. So I'm going to talk about uh, these identity integration challenges and how by creating a single logical reference list of your identities that then you can synchronize into your identity provider can allow you to support uh, authentication and the information, the attributes, and the groups that you need for enforcing your authorization properly. So at the highest level, the challenges are going to start because on one side of the architecture, up on the top left there, you have the applications that are providing the services. So this could be your SharePoint, Salesforce, Dropbox. And they need to be able to authenticate and authorize users for those services. On the other side, you have the uh, distributed data silos that contain the internal user and group populations. So in order to service these user populations, those applications have to be able to, first of all, connect to these variety of different systems. Oftentimes, applications can't even connect to more than one, um, maintain those connections to more than one data source. And then even if they could, the number of connections that would need to be managed every time you bring on a new application or if you introduce a new data source, those start to grow exponentially. So that's what's being depicted here on this slide. The application also would have to understand how to identify a user in each of these systems. How do they authenticate a user? Is it password? Is it MFA? How do they retrieve the profile attributes, all the group memberships, the things that are required to enforce authorization? And also, how do you adjust in the future? Your data silos are constantly evolving, dealing with mergers and acquisitions, migrations, consolidation efforts. So you can see this type of system doesn't scale well. Some applications have even tried to um, add some flexibility to support multiple data sources, maybe some identity mapping to link overlapping accounts. But generally, from what we've seen, that just results in more customizations, more configurations that now you have to maintain at the application level. And if you set this up at the level of the application, then you can't share that across other applications. So you're just redoing this effort many times. So like I talked about, the federation aspect and the federating the access across the application has been an approach to solve the challenges around this application expansion. In federation, you have the role of the identity provider, and that's to authenticate users and manage the single sign-on across all the relying parties that trust it. So after the user is authenticated, the identity provider generates and translates the tokens for the user to be able to then access all the different relying party applications without having to enter the credentials again. 
So this is federating the access, and that's for the, the different applications there. When you look at um, this kind of architecture for these claims-enabled applications, those are the uh, service providers, the relying parties, they rely on and then will redirect the authentication request to the identity provider. So at a high level, it's that identity provider now that's going to be responsible for connecting to the different data sources, handling the different data formats, and how to authenticate the user. And then that identity provider will package up all that information, all the assertions, the claims about the user inside the token, and redirect that user back to the application that will now grant them their access. So the minute you start to have multiple different heterogeneous data sources, now things get complex. So in cases like this, the identity provider's job just got a lot more difficult. So what happens if the data sources aren't exclusive and users have accounts in more than one of them? So now the identity provider must not only be able to access the different data sources, uh, understand the different metadata, know how to request authentication, but also dealing with situations where searches for a user could return more than a single entry. So is it the same person? If not, which one's the identity I need to authenticate? These types of challenges are going to be addressed by a federated identity layer. So I'll focus today on separating these two aspects and um, clarifying what layer is responsible, what each layer is responsible for. This diagram depicts the complexity of migrating to the cloud, which is another aspect that, that causes this um, layer to be much more complex. So, so for applications in Office 365, identities need to be synchronized into Azure AD. For applications hosted in AWS, a different identity source might be required. So these are represented in the map as the Azuria and Amazonia at the top. Other components here include the sources of the users that need to access these applications. Things like multiple Active Directory domains and forests, um, LDAP directories, relational databases. Many of our customers have dealt with mergers and acquisitions, which brings additional data sources and integration challenges as well. So you can see in the diagram here the various little FID blimps that sit between all the data silos and then the cloud services and the storages. Those blimps are what address the identity and group integration challenges. And they compute the, the reference lists that can be used to uh, initialize those cloud services and keep them in sync. So they represent the, the glue or the link in this hybrid world of cloud storages and the on-premise data silos. With the growth of the cloud and the vast migration to the cloud, we're starting to see the need for even more than one integration hub. Some of our customers have uh, more than one cloud environment deployed, and they have the need to customize their identity reference list to accommodate each. So for example, a certain subset of identities needs to have accounts synchronized to Azure AD, while another subset of identities requires an account to access resources in AWS. So it might not just be one global, one-size-fits-all identity integration hub. You could very well need to have um, different, multiple identity integration hubs servicing different needs. So when you start to look for solutions, you want to make sure that you understand that there's really these two layers that are required, the federated access layer the part that provides that token creation and the translation between the different federation protocols and the layer that enforces the single sign-on. The other part is the federated identity layer, the global reference list to identify and authenticate your users. Um, you need one single access point to retrieve a complete profile of the users. This means their attributes, um, the groups that they're a member of, and then this layer is provided by the federated identity service. So whether the architecture consists of uh, components running on premises or maybe something entirely in the cloud, often our customers have a kind of a hybrid deployment of, of both. You need a federated identity service layer in order to have that complete solution. So you don't have to tightly couple the consumers of the identity to the various authoritative identity sources that you have. 
This allows that federation, the IDP server, to focus on the task of generating the tokens and doing the translation between the different federation protocols, um, managing that federated access across all the reliant parties that provide services, and it leaves that complex identity integration task to a layer that's specialized for this service. This diagram and um, the ones coming up in the following slides, the references of um, TechVision. So Gary briefly talked about, so showed some of these during his presentation. Um, but they basically detail the functions that comprise an identity service. So if you look here, there are essentially three functions. Uh, one, an identity integration service that connects to um, the variety of different data silos and creates that aggregated view of all the identities and all the groups. Um, an authentication service that allows the applications to access a single reference list that they can look up against to identify and authenticate the user. And then number three, an authorization service that can be um, an enforcement point of what a user is allowed to do. So the enforcement point may be the consuming application itself, in which case the authorization service would be the uh, policy information point, right? The store where the user profile attributes and the group membership information is located. And then the consuming application would simply get this information and then use it to enforce authorization for the user within the, the context of that application. An identity service can also um, create and deliver different views of the identity data in different formats and different protocols to match the needs of that consuming application. So for example, the green application here expects a hierarchical view of data and it needs to be accessed through LDAP. And then the red application expects data organized maybe uh, geographically and it's reachable as a RESTful web service. So when you have an identity integration layer in place, you can deliver multiple different views of the identity data through different protocols to meet those applications' needs. Another important aspect of um, an identity service is that engine that performs joins and other computations on the, um, the data and delivering the information at a guaranteed speed. So this means being able to cache the data and have a way to refresh the cache image, obviously, as uh, changes are detected in those authoritative um, data sources. So this is a key function of dealing with complex integration challenges, performing um, distributed join, attribute remappings, computations on the fly. All of this would be extremely time consuming to do. So since the primary storage and the usage of um, an identity service, you're using it for security, right? Authentication and authorization. So if it doesn't perform at top speeds, it's not going to be very usable here. So having that ability to have that persistent view, that cached image to deliver quickly to the applications is going to be key. So let's take a look at the Radiant One Federated Identity Service and how it performs the functions of um, what I've talked about, the aggregation of identities, the orchestration, um, and facilitates the authentication and authorization. So with Radiant One, all of the identities are going to be aggregated, and they're remapped into one common namespace. And then a federation and IDP server can use this reference list to search and locate all of the users. So this simplifies that first step in authentication, which is the identification of a user. Once the user is identified, then the credentials can be checked. Um, the Federated Identity Service maintains that global reference list. So that includes the links back to the data sources that identity was found in. So with those links, in cases where you need to validate a password, you don't want to synchronize passwords necessarily all over the place, the Federated Identity Service can delegate the credential checking to the appropriate backend as needed. Using Radiant One um, in this kind of identity hub approach, you can bring in new user populations quickly without disrupting what you've already put in place. So this alleviates the need to modify the identity service provider. So every time data sources change, you don't have to worry about um, setting up new configurations, new mappings, new identity linking logic. So that might also come in, into play as well. Um, we're seeing a lot of consolidation efforts too, where user stores are being consolidated and, and, and going away. 
So the application gets shielded from these types of um, changes to your data sources. For large companies, um, a lot of our customers deal with these two basic um, challenges when it comes to overlapping user accounts. Having to deal with multiple heterogeneous data sources is just as a fact for a lot of our large customers. So as that amount of user overlap grows, the identity integration challenges starts to become more complex, where you can't just simply aggregate all your identity sources anymore, and round-robin types of searching no longer solves the problem. It's too slow. So here are some basic examples um, of what you could see when you deal with multiple heterogeneous sources. So one example on the left is the same physical person is known by two different identifiers. So if you don't identify first that these are the same person, Lana might be able to authenticate fine, but may not be authorized properly if policies have been defined based on her um, profile or group, group information, and that's stored in a different backend. And if I didn't have a single way to identify it's the same person, how can you uniquely identify Lana and get all her profile and group information if she's known by two different identifiers and in two different data sources? Um, and the next example on the right, you have a case of multiple data sources could have the same identifier representing different physical people. Again, identification is a challenge here because a single identifier no longer represents a, a unique person. Um, and even more concerning, though, would be the thought of incorrectly authorizing somebody based on the wrong user information returned. You wouldn't want Steve Matthews, an intern, being authorized as Sarah Matthews, the CEO. So having the duplicate identifier um, or having different identifiers for the same person, those are some of the challenges that we're seeing with our customers. The diagram here represents a, a quick introduction to the methodology of building this federated identity service. Each repository, so directories, relational databases, applications, they all store the information in their own format um, and has to be accessed using a certain protocol. So the capability to extract the metadata from each of these sources and create um, what we call the common object model is a key capability of the Federated Identity Service. So this is the first step, and it's the basis for performing the services offered by Radiant One. So object and attribute mapping, correlation joining, auto-generating groups, and view design, they all start with this. Once you have that metadata information, you can start to combine a set of attributes that you want to act as a correlation key. And this will allow you to determine a match. Then the duplicate entries that can be consolidated, and you can build that global reference list where each user is only represented once, so a union set. When the user is located in more than one source, that identity hub maintains the link back to those local identifiers. And like I talked about, those links are critical for things like credential checking. So if you want us to validate a user's password against their authoritative source, um, this reference list becomes the index. So we know exactly where that user is located and we'll only check the, um, those sources for authentication. So you don't have to do a, a blind round robin search like you would typically find in a, a virtual directory layer. The left side of the diagram here is uh, basically a high-level summary of what I just talked about on the previous slide. So how Radiant One virtualizes data sources to integrate identities. This is also um, includes the aggregation and computing of group memberships as well. So by implementing this virtualization layer, now you can project many different views of identity to serve a variety of applications. So the apps shown over on the right here in this diagram. Each one of those apps gets a view that's catered to their needs and then accessed with the desired protocol as well. So the consumer of um, the identity reference list could be a federation server, an IDP. Um, it could access the identity service with LDAP, or there could be other applications using things like Skim, SQL, REST. So this layer that you put in place can easily be reused for other purposes as well, other applications. So you maximize your return on your investment. For Radiant One, the virtualization engine is at the core, and that is what provides an abstraction layer for all the identity sources. So this gives those applications that single point of access to locate identities and the profile information. 
And then we refer to this central access point and this unique list as the identity hub. Each application, um, each data source, they all become spokes off of this central hub. So taking on new initiatives that call for a new application, or if you have those mergers and acquisitions or consolidation efforts, and you get a whole new user population, or you have to juggle and um, reduce, you know, remove some users, the integration effort is uh, much more quickly by setting up this, this hub and spoke type of a model. It's this layer that handles the aggregation, the correlation, the mappings, the computations, uh, the joining, and then defining those application-specific views of the data. Part of this is the storage component, and that is known as HDAP. This storage is um, our own implementation. It's a fully LDAP-compatible storage, but it's more modern. It's a more modern architecture. It's based on big data technologies like Zookeeper and Lucene. So once you've rationalized all your users and your groups and you've modeled these different desired views and the hierarchies, and you can have many different views like I talked about, you can then persist that in the HDAP store so that you have the access to this information at very high speed. So it's the combination of both the integration layer and the storage that make up the federated identity service. What is HDAP? So I just talked about it briefly, but HDAP is the really one um, big data directory. It's the storage component of our solution. Um, it can outperform traditional LDAP directories for basic searches, um, especially when the searches are mixed in with some update operations, so when uh, clients are issuing um, searches and updates. This is due to the increased replication speed across our HDAP cluster nodes, how it's deployed. I'll talk more about clusters in just a second. Um, so HDAP allows for more flexible searches because the indexing structure that it uses, it's geared towards support for things like full text search, leveraging an inverted index as opposed to the, the classic B tree like you would find with traditional LDAP directories. So this allows you to benefit from indexing even on low cardinality attributes. And when you start to look at uh, things like profile attributes that you want to use to maybe dynamically categorize and group people into different um, roles, title, department, location, these attributes aren't going to be unique across your entire user population. So it's oftentimes these attributes that things like policy servers need to access to enforce their fine-grained authorization. Querying on attributes like this can kill the performance of a traditional LDAP server, which is why, obviously, uh, back in the day, the directory administrators, they would constrain those app owners on the types of queries that could be issued, right? Um, as I mentioned, HDAP supports the classic LDAP v3 access protocol, but in addition to that, you can also uh, use skim and REST as well, making it much more flexible, much more future-proof. A quick architecture to talk about how HDAP is deployed. It runs in a cluster architecture for high availability and scalability. Um, within a cluster architecture, there are at least two core nodes that are required. So the diagram here depicts three. Um, you could have two as well. It just depends on the level of high availability that you need to serve your, um, your client load. There's also a load balancer, which isn't in this diagram, but that is what actually will direct the client traffic across all of the cluster nodes. So of the core nodes, there's always um, generally one leader, there is one leader, and more, one or more follower nodes. So the leader is um, responsible for ensuring the consistency of the HDAP data across the other nodes. Another aspect not here is the, um, the leader follower status and the configuration consistency across the cluster. That's where Zookeeper comes into play. It makes sure that any configuration changes made on any of the nodes is replicated and available for all the other nodes as well. Um, another advantage of deploying a cluster like this is um, the ease at which you can scale. So you can add nodes really fast. And once you install Radiant 1 on a new machine, you indicate you want to join a cluster. All the configuration and all the HDAP store data is Im immediately applied to that new node, so it becomes operational very quickly. Um, if you have the need for multiple sites, you can deploy a cluster in um, each data center. So essentially, each of your, your sites or your geographically located data centers would have um, their own cluster deployed 
and then you could have replication across the clusters as well. We've seen a trend um, with our customers who have uh, started to use this, our identity service by more than just LDAP applications. Um, more and more applications are accessing our service uh, as a RESTful web service. So Radiant One's REST interface is named ADAP, and um, we also support SKIM, which is also REST-based. However, one unique aspect of our ADAP interface is that it allows you to navigate your hierarchical views whereas the skim interface is primarily for reading flat list of users and groups and primarily for provisioning. So for some applications, the hierarchy is important, and ADAP allows them to navigate the hierarchies using a web service interface. So there's some advantages to that. For the majority of our customers, there's two main cloud environments. There's Azure and there's AWS. Um, one of the big drivers for Azure is obviously the move to Office 365. Um, for Azure applications, you have to have an identity in Azure AD. That's the cloud directory. And then um, Microsoft has come up with a specialized sync process for moving Active Directory users from on-prem into Azure AD, which is fine until you start to have identities in other non-Microsoft stores. Uh, so if you need to get that information into the cloud, your integration effort becomes much more difficult. And that's where the value of Radiant One FID can really shine here. It allows you to um, connect to the different data sources, build that reference image, and then you can leverage something like Azure AD Connect, or we have a synchronization component named ICS, which you'll see in the diagram here. And those are the synchronization pipes that will synchronize the identities to the cloud and then keep the data in sync as um, the on-premise data sources uh, evolve. When you start moving to the cloud apps, you quickly see you've got those additional provisioning challenges on your hands now because each application is going to require a certain aspect of the user's profile. So some cloud applications, like Salesforce, for example, they even support a, a just-in-time provisioning where they can leverage what gets passed in a token to create the needed account locally if they need to. But this means what you package inside the token, it needs to be accurate and then also in the relevance of the context of the application. So you want to make sure that comes from a reference image for the identities. All right, so it's, and also, as I've talked about, it's not just um, Azure AD or AWS. You might have um, other uh, identity providers, maybe an Okta even in the mix, and a lot of our customers have more than one. So having that specialized data source that integrates the identities and is able to build that image that then gets referenced for all the different cloud providers um, is definitely essential and gives you a lot of flexibility there. All right, just a quick summary and we'll move on. I do see some questions come in. We'll try to get to a couple of them. Um, basically, if you're looking to expand a federation or, or you're starting a new federation project, don't overlook the need to federate your identity layer as well. A lot of companies have a, a mix of Active Directory domains, heterogeneous data sources as well, LDAP directories, databases, lots of legacy stuff. So across these sources, you'll also have those overlapping user accounts I talked about. There can be some challenges there. Also with groups of users and dealing with uh, group members that may cross different data silos. So with Radiant One as that flexible piece of infrastructure, you're really modernizing your identity and directory uh, layer. And that once you put that in place, you can leverage that and reuse it for other initiatives as well. So you're easily able to adjust to new requirements in the future and maximize your return on your investment here. There is a reference to um, a document within the webinar that complements what we've talked about today, so do be sure to download that. And I will jump over now to get to some of your questions quickly. Uh, let's see. Here's one here. So Gary, this one's for you. Um, when do you think there will be enough issuers and verifiers in the self-sovereign identity space for it to work well? Well, I think um, there, um, I think it will come together 
Uh, the question the question is when uh, I think it will occur based on communities of interest. There won't be one big thing. Uh, so we're seeing efforts like um, amongst the credit unions in the U.S. where um, uh, you know we're seeing critical mass. We're seeing um, verifiers uh, emerging in that space. We're seeing that uh, in some of the government agencies in Canada. We're seeing it amongst healthcare providers in the UK. So we're we're starting to see these enclaves um, at at scale uh, across multiple areas. I think it'll be a couple of years. I'd like to see it a little bit faster uh, and perhaps just given some of the challenges we're all facing that I spent some time talking about maybe it'll be a little bit faster but you know there are some big ecosystems that need to be developed to support that we see a couple of industry activities at least it's all under one umbrella we, um, uh, talk about self-sovereign identity there's a uh, not-for-profit that's that's driving that. Uh, so maybe there's some additional potential there. We have uh, the trust over IP uh, effort that I think is, is helping there as well. Great. Thank you, Gary. Um, all right. We do, I do see some more questions have come in. Um, we'll go ahead and offer, uh, answer those offline after the webinar today through email. Um, I did just want to mention one last thing for those of you still on. Uh, our next webinar, Expedite your M&A, Integrate Your Identity Infrastructure with Radiant One. That's coming up in a couple weeks on January the 28th, so be sure to tune in for that. And lastly, Gary, thank you for your time, and thank you everyone who attended today. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, everyone.